Hey, we are making our way gradually through Capstone. I know that it's not necessarily been the easiest so far, but you are definitely making progress. I know that, and I look forward to seeing what else we can do together. So let's get into methods today. Okay, so I want to talk about methods, which is not necessarily the most fun aspect of any capstone or major research project, but obviously it's a really important one. And uh, I think there's just two words, two ideas that I want to discuss, and that's, that's it for today, really. So there are two things that are interrelated. You should have heard of them before, but it's also understandable if, you know, it's still hard to define. So the first word or concept is ontology. So ontology is basically relating to what exists, which can get really philosophical and metaphysical, but all I want you to think about in terms of your capstone and in terms of your method is what do you know exists and what doesn't exist, or if it does exist, you can't really know it. And that leads to the other term, which is epistemology. So again, another challenging term, perhaps, but something really important. So epistemology is about knowing things, how you know things. Ontology is about what exists. And together, that's a fundamental um, question, is what exists and how do you know it? Your method is really about identifying that. And, you know, so what exists ontologically and how do you know it exists? And to give you a few examples, right? There is a big difference between somebody telling you what they think and somebody actually doing things. And they can contradict, and there's been some really interesting studies, studies about left brain, right brain uh, hemispheres and how they contradict each other. You know, if you ask someone to do something visually and then you ask someone to do something logically, which is a different part of the brain, the person will justify themselves in different ways, but will do different things. And so, anyway, not to get too out there, but there's a bunch of stuff that may or may not exist, but because we don't know it, we can't really do anything with it. And so in this case, for media especially, you're probably thinking about, you know, what was the writer's intention, or what was the artist's intention, what was the producer's intention, what was the studio's intention, and you simply can't know that because even if you did have access to the studio film director or whoever you're interested in, he or she may say, I'm interested in social justice, but then they're actually not doing anything in favor of social justice. And so even if you had the opportunity to ask them, hey, what was your intention? You can't necessarily take at face value what they say. And that's why reading about um, interviews, for, if, you're, if you're thinking about directors and movies, for example, reading interviews is good because what you can say in your review of, of the past, you know, explanations or whatever, is that the director said this. And so you know that the director said something. What you don't know necessarily is how truthful that is, although you can weigh that against other evidence. And so epistemology is really about asking, how do we know and what are the ways that we can know something? So you can know for sure, assuming you're not colorblind, what colors are present in an ad, right? And you can say, these ads use more blue than they do red. And blue is traditionally associated with more calming ideas and red is more active uh, ideas, love, rage, whatever. And so you can make arguments about that. Um, what you can't necessarily know is how people respond to that unless you're doing some kind of psychological research where you're bringing people into a room and showing them red and blue or something, all you can say is that based on what other studies have said, we know or we have a strong sense that these colors are associated with this and these colors are associated with that. And you can justify that by having background information. But I say this because a lot of the time people want to say, why do these ads have an effect on people and what is that effect? And like I said, unless you are literally bringing people into a laboratory and measuring things, you really don't know how people respond in the sense that 
you know, people get angry or people get happy. But you can perhaps measure the responses to an ad by what people have written on social media, what reviewers have said in newspapers and, and other media that review films and television shows and stuff like that, right? So this is important because you want to know what is out there that you can know and how can you know it. And that's what your method is about. So again, you can know for certain how many times journalists in a certain newspaper, for example, have said the words terrorist or used the words terrorist in their articles because you can count that and then you can say, look, in this one month period, they said it 200 times. That you can know, right? Epistemologically, you can know that because you, all you have to do is read the articles. Whether people have good intentions is not something you can know for sure because you, you can't get into their heads. But what you can say is, this newspaper dwells on concepts of foreignness, as we can see by this and this and this, uh, these articles, uh, whereas this talks about the benefits of social diversity. And so these two newspapers focus on different things. So you can know what they focus on. You can't necessarily know why they focus on it or how that focus affects people. You can say things, for example, like... Um, in these areas or these jurisdictions or whatever, these are problems that have been documented by, say, police or by politicians or by uh, social service organizations. You can say that and you can know what numbers are documented. But again, you don't necessarily know that those are 100 percent of the cases that you're interested in, because obviously some issues don't get documented. Right. Not everyone who gets bullied goes to somebody and gets counted as having been bullied. And so you can say it's estimated that, you know, 50% of students experience bullying in their high school or something, but you also know that that's not a 100% rule, that's an estimate based on whatever the researcher is using, right? So what can you say that you know, or what will you be able to say that you know after doing your research using this method? That's the main question. What exists out there? What are you confident that exists and how do you know it exists or how are you going to measure it? So you can't necessarily say these are all good people or these are all bad people because that's a very hard thing to measure, right? Also, you want to make sure that you are doing it reliably and reproducible, making it reproducible so that if, let's say, I were going to do your research again, just to double check you, uh, which I would love to do if I could, but you know, in all honesty, I'm not going to recount everything that you do, but... Maybe I'll say, that number seems off. I'm going to look into that a little bit. And so if you've done it well, you've highlighted exactly what you're counting or what you're measuring or what you're analyzing and how you're doing it so that if I go into one room and you go into another room and we both just have your method section, we should basically get the same numbers. Now, obviously, there's a subjective element to it, especially if you're doing qualitative research where you're uh, assessing things or analyzing things based on your own interpretation. But again, your interpretation can't come from nowhere, right? If people are saying a bunch of really cruel things about foreigners, then you, you know, effectively have to say that that journal or that newspaper organization, whatever, is very critical of immigration. Whereas if somebody is saying all of the benefits of immigration, then you really can't say that this journal is xenophobic unless you have some really great evidence for that. And so even the subjective pieces have to be built on evidence. So you, you know something based on evidence. What you don't know usually, you know, and when it comes to media studies is what your audience does or how it responds. Because first of all, you can't get into their heads. And secondly, you don't necessarily know that the one media or the one image or the one film that, that you're interested in is the reason people are acting a certain way. So you might be able to find correlation, right? You might be able to say, like, more Republicans watch these television shows and more Democrats watch these television shows based on survey data, but you can't necessarily say that this show makes people Democratic or Republican or whatever, right? And so it's really important to think and to just keep asking yourself as you're developing your method section, what do you know, what can you know, and then how do you know it? So... On one level, it's super easy, right? If you are counting how many times a word appears in a journal, you can know how many times a word appears in a journal. You can't know necessarily the effect of that word, but you can also um, establish that you know this is a, a very loaded term and it appeals to these audiences based on the numbers that I've found in the terms of demographics, readership. And so you can make arguments, but you can't know 
something like everyone who reads this article is now hateful or everyone who is hateful goes and reads this article. So there may be correlations where people are politically more one way or another way, but you can't necessarily say that the article or the film or whatever made people that way. And so that's where people get into trouble. They'll say something like, um, I'm going to study lyrics of music and then they're going to say that they'll establish how, how violent people are. And studying lyrics of music is cool, but it definitely cannot tell you how violent people are. And even if you had two different stats, the amount of violence in music and the amount of violence in the world, you couldn't necessarily say that it comes from one or the other, right? And so that's where people get into the most trouble, is they make these claims that they just simply can't uh, validate. So we can go back and forth. I mean, you can email me or we, we can talk virtually and we can figure out what is it that you're able to know and what method will help you know it. But that's what I want you to work on today. It's, uh, it's small in terms of how many words you'll use. It's probably the smallest section of your whole paper, the method section. But it's also probably the most important because if you make a mistake here, and don't get, I know this is going to stress you, so don't get too worried. But if you make a mistake, meaning like, I'm going to read this newspaper and then I'm going to make an argument about why the president was elected, you, that's a big jump, right? And you're making some epistemological or ontological mistakes, assuming that you can know why a president was elected based on one newspaper. So you want to say maybe something smaller, like what kind of stories are being represented of the presidential candidates in these newspapers? And that you can, you can say, right? You can say this newspaper has the presidential candidates on the left more positively based on th these the ways that I'm counting. And this newspaper or whatever has more negative coverage of one party over the other. And you can make those arguments. You can't necessarily say that that will make people vote for one or the other, but you can definitely say these are the kinds of stories. So that's actually another really important element. And I think I've talked to most of you about this. If you're doing some kind of content analysis, all you know is the content. You don't know the effect of the content for the most part. I mean, definitely for what we've been talking about, you don't know the effect of the content. You just know the content. And that's not a bad thing. It's only a bad thing when you only know the content, but then you make claims about other things that you can't know, either because it's impossible to know or because you can't know it from just studying the content. There are psychological studies that measure, you know, um, the chemicals in your bloodstream and stuff like that. We're not doing that. There are other studies that might ask people a series of questions and then give them a series of tests and look at uh, correlations there. What we are doing, for the most part, is looking at content, whether that's in films, advertisements, whatever. And so all you can know is what messages are being put out into the world. You don't necessarily know and you probably won't ever know how they're being received. You can look at comments, but again, you don't necessarily know how representative that is because maybe only angry people are on this media station or this um, platform commenting. And so that doesn't necessarily say all Americans feel this way, but you could still know that 90% of the comments on this page are negative and here's how I've counted. So you can know that, you just can't make a jump. A lot of people make jumps into things that they don't know. So it's really important to kind of assess what can you know and you put that here and then what can you not know and then you forget about that you can say in your essay look i'm interested in why people are doing these things and i think this discourse may contribute to it so i'm studying the discourse you can't know exactly how the discourse makes people do things because it probably doesn't make people right it's not that specific it might help it might push it might perpetuate it might um convince or it might um I don't know, challenge. Like there are a number of ways that you can talk about it. You don't want to just jump to the cause and effect, especially if you're making a big jump from like one article or one film and then saying, this is why Americans do this. So it's actually pretty simple, but it is an important step to sit back, ask yourself, what can I know? What does my method tell me? And does that help answer my question? And if it doesn't, or if there's a gap between your question and your method, then you, we can rework it until your question and your method work together. So if you want to know how negative or how positive are the representations of this group in this medium, then you can obviously look at the representations and try to answer that in, in a specific way, building on other research. But you can't say, you know, 
how good is it to be a man or a woman today based on this video game? Because, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. And so as long as you're not making these big jumps, which you might make at the very beginning, but then we can whittle it down to something manageable, you'll be totally fine. So again, not a huge step in terms of word count or anything, but a super important step to make sure that your research is valid, reproducible, and ontologically and epistemologically sound. Look forward to seeing what you do. Take care.